I'm Mike DeLuca. Welcome to this rare in the trenches look at the craft of screenwriting. Today I'm joined by Simon Kinberg, who's penned the screenplays for Mr. and Mrs. Smith, Triple X, State of the Union, and X Men 3. He currently has uh, projects all over town, in all five studios, all seven studios, in various stages of development. And he has a television uh, production deal with Jerry Bruckheimer. Welcome, Simon. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Now, you're Phi Beta Kappa from Brown with a penchant for liking breakdancing movies. That's true. What did you take away from the Electric Boogaloo 2 experience? What did I take away from Electric Boogaloo? Or one, um, really. Uh, I took this away. <laughs> I pretty much start every meeting that way. It right. sort of sets a tone. Loosen, loosen things up? Yeah, no, it just sets a tone. Um, uh, well, uh, I did actually take a love of musicals away from those. You know, when I was growing up in the 80s, the only musicals we had really were other than Xanadu. Right. Uh, Boogaloo, uh, don't you know, you Break In, about, Beat Street. Don't you feel bad for Gene Kelly being suckered into Xanadu? I, I do, actually. Because you know he thought he was making something hip and fun. Well, there is a certain low element of hipness to Xanadu. I don't know if you've seen it recently, but like roller oh, skating. I, I hadn't totally understood the roller skating <laughs> phenomenon until I saw Xanadu. Right. And like I'd never been to Venice Beach before. Right. Um, whatever happened to Michael Beck? That's a very good question. There's a lot of whatever happened to you know, 80s musicals. I don't know what happened to Boogaloo Shrimp. What about Nancy Walker, directed You Can't Stop the Music? Did not know that. Very mm -hmm. interesting. Rose Special K, I don't know where she is either. <laughs> so no, there's a lot of really right. talented people that went through the musical uh, genre in the 80s and make it out the other side. So. Oh, you mean like Steve Gutenberg? Steve Gutenberg. Sorry, Steve, if you want. Steve Gutenberg, as, as he says, is you know, one of the richest men in the world. Those police academy movies <laughs> play all over the world continuously. Right. How did you come in contact with Electric Boogaloo 2? And what, I, was there an, uh, a subtitle? If there was, I'm blanking on it. Electric Boogaloo 2. No, it was Break Into Electric Boogaloo. Oh, thank you. Yeah, okay. no. Break and, Into Electric Boogaloo. And actually, when I was working on Triple X 2, I really wanted to call it Triple X 2 Electric Boogaloo, <laughs> but the, there wasn't a whole lot of support at the studio for that. Right. Um, and I think there were maybe some rights issues. <laughs> but. Uh, you know, I, how I came about it, came across it, is that I loved musicals. I loved my, for me, contemporary musicals were breakdancing movies. And there is, there are a few movies that were actually good breakdancing movies. Like Beat Street is, for a connoisseur, Beat Street is a very good breakdancing movie. And the, truly, it, you know, joking aside, one thing that I did learn from watching those and then eventually sort of, let's say, more classic musicals, um, is a certain structure for storytelling. I mean, there is a real relationship between musicals and genre films, specifically action movies. I worked a little bit with John Woo, um, and one of the ways that he structures his action films, um, you probably know this, is he looks at each action sequence like a musical number. And what I mean by that is not just that they're paced out 10 to 15 minutes apart, but also that they are an expression or an exploration of character. It's like when the characters get too emotional, they have to break in a song. Oh, that's interesting. So you, you take some of that approach for when you craft an action set. Absolutely. I mean, I think if, if you write an action set piece and it's not a necessary outgrowth of character, it's interstitial. And more often than not, in my experience, those are the, the set pieces that'll get attacked in pre-production or production and they'll get cut for budget or cut down at the very least. If you can justify them in terms of character, it's hard to cut them and have the continuity of the movie remain intact. What's your favorite musical? Wow, that's a tough question. What's my favorite musical? Um, what do you watch you know, over and over again? At you home? know, one movie that I watch over and over again, and I watch it on set a lot, like when I'm sitting in a trailer and I have nothing to do, is West Side Story. Oh, wow. I adore West Side Story. I mean, I just think the storytelling is amazing. The music is incredible. And there's an energy. I mean, there's an energy to musicals in general that I think that no other genre really has. And West Side Story, to me, is like a lightning bolt. It, from the beginning to the end, you really feel like you're thrusting for the entire time. And What well, has that wonderful sh you know, structure of Romeo and Juliet? So yeah. you've got the, the best structure in the world to hang that movie on. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think that... It, um, and all the, musicals, musicals, all, the, all the musical numbers, as you were saying, in that movie are They're all character. about character. No, they're, I mean, it's an amazingly emotional movie. And I think that you know, musicals, for whatever reason, either because music is an emotional medium or because they're just well, you know, those stories are well-suited to being told in musicals, are really emotional movies. And for me, I mean, I watched West Side Story over and over again, and every single time the end of the movie comes, I start to tear up, and you know, I know what's coming, and I've seen it a million times, but it is as emotional to me as seeing Romeo and Juliet, whether the play or the, or the various movies. Um, and I just think there's something about West Side Story that is cool, despite the fact that it's like, you know, 40, 50 years old, um, in a way that like, you know, breakdancing movies, all love to them, haven't really aged right. as well. And you know, directors are still copying that aerial of Manhattan, yeah. you know, as he pans for the title sequence. I, yeah. st I saw it in New Jack City, we had it in mm -hmm. Menace to Society. Directors still copy that. Yeah, no, I mean, shots. even in Heat, I mean, great directors are copying yeah. it as well. So, uh, you know, there are certain cinematic elements to it, and the screenplay, Ernest Lehman's screenplay, that movie is a fantastic adaptation. I mean, taking a play, in general, I think when you take a play, obviously, and turn it into a movie, it's a very hard adaptation because the, I mean, I think there is more difference between plays and movies than there are novels and movies. Novels are a little bit more, there's more velocity to them, you can move in, from space to space, whereas you're much more obviously like set bound in a stage. And the way that he pulled it off the stage and really gave it a certain sort of momentum was, uh, was pretty amazing. 
Is adapting something or working with something from comic books like like, like X Men Three mm -hmm. is that like adapting a novel or is that a whole separate uh, I think process? It, it, I think it's pre I think it's very different. I think comic books and novels are so different because novels you are inheriting the characters and usually a story, right. whereas when you're adapting comic books, you're inheriting a whole lot of characters, most of whom you actually have to cut out of the movie because you don't have right. the luxury of doing the 150 mutants from the X-Men comics, um, and you're really not focusing on a singular storyline because there's so many stories, there's 50 years of stories. Um, so it's a very different process, but what is the same is that you have the texture of the characters and you inherit that texture, which right. I think helps a lot in, in, in writing scripts. Now, do you read other screenplays, either classics or, or stuff that's going on around town just to keep uh, fresh or, or to, to honor what's come before? Are you a big screenplay reader? Both. Um, you know, the best education I had about screenplays was reading other scripts, um, not reading scripts that were in development or in production, but actually reading old classic scripts. I was in film school. Uh, All Columbia. kinds of genres? All across genre, yeah. I mean, every, every, yeah, every type of movie, as long as I thought it was a good screenplay. In um, New York, there's an amazing resource the New York Performing Arts Library, which is a part of the New York Public Library, has an archive of old scripts. Is it in the main building? It's not in the main building. It's actually in a building that's right by Lincoln Center, which was across the street from where I was living in New York. So I'd go in there, and it's, and it's, it's considered an archive. During your dance training? Yeah, during the, right, straight right from Juilliard, Center, I'd, go right. Right into, okay. uh, yeah, I'd go right into uh, uh, the Performing Arts Library, and the, uh, these, the screenplays are the original scripts, so they're not literally copies. They're scripts that they had on set more often than not. So you have sort of yellowed paper from 1940s. Oh, that's wonderful. Were there notes written in the margins? There are notes. There's a Sidney Lumet collection. There's an Al Pacino collection where you're reading Dog Day Afternoon, you're seeing their notes. That's an incredible resource. It's an astonishing one. And, and you know, I've found, you know, I went, I studied film as an undergrad. I, I went to film school. I learned a lot. I've learned a lot from working in movies, but I've, in terms of the, the, the medium, the craft of screenwriting, I've never learned as much as I did from just sitting there and reading three, four great scripts a day. And what do you feel you learned from that experience? Like what, what, what did you take away from reading the scripts uh, the most? Well, I mean, I think I learned a lot about structure from reading those, more than I learned. I, I think that one of the mistakes that young screenwriters, which is what I was, and I guess to some extent still am, but um, one of the mistakes that young screenwriters make is that they read so many books on how to write a screenplay right. rather than reading screenplays themselves. Um, and, you know, initially I had imagined that screenplays were more similar to movies than in fact they are. They are a very distinct medium. They're a different medium um, than the actual films themselves. And I think um, as much as you need to learn about writing movies from watching movies, you more need to actually read the scripts themselves and understand structure, understand the way that setups and payoffs work in scripts, that there's a sort of like math to the structure um, of movies. And the best screenplays, um, the texture of the characters, the reality of the dialogue is so good that you actually don't see the gears turning. You don't actually hear the sort of the equations of the math as it's going. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem with a lot of screenplays that I read, now I do read screenplays that are in development, one, to know what's going on in town, two, because I get set things to rewrite. Or, um, and I think what a lot of screenwriters sort of run into is they rely too much on structure. They rely too much on the math of it, and you can actually see page 30 this happens, page 60 this happens, page 90 that happens. And, um, it doesn't have the same organic feel that a lot of those early screenplays, whether they be Sidney Lumet or Ernest Lehman or Paddy Shafsky, mm -hmm. um, have to them. What was your favorite? Favorite screenplay? Yeah. God, that's a tough question. Uh, One uh, that you enjoyed reading the most. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny. I love reading screenplays where you feel the writer um, loves writing, meaning that they take as much time to describe things in the exposition as they do to hone the dialogue. Right. Um, so I love... Butch Cass and the Sundance Kid are some of the greatest exposition of all time. I mean, there's that scene where um, Butch kicks, kicks Logan in the balls, and William Goldman describes it as the most exquisite kick in the balls in the history of cinema. <laughs> you know, and right. it, there's just a tone that that kind of writing um, invokes. So Butch and Sundance is obviously one of the great ones to me. North by Northwest, I think, is almost a perfect screenplay. I'm always impressed by scripts that can create and sustain a very specific and sort of perverse tone. And Bush and Sundance has that. North by Northwest, I think, is one of the strangest tones um, of any genre movie I've ever read. So those, and, and, and in terms of contemporary or relatively contemporary scripts, I love Jim Cameron scripts. Mm -hmm. Reading the Terminator movies, um, reading True Lies. There's just a density to the exposition. There's a density and a texture to the characters and a reality and yet a style to the dialogue. Um, that just feels really authored, that you really feel like you're in the hands of a great writer. And in your own work, do you try to make it a, a reading experience and do those things with description and action? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think more than anything, it's not that the things that you're describing are going to be the things that the production designer uses to you know, dictate the way right. the wall's going to look or that the second unit director is going to use for the actual physical action of the movie, but you're really doing it to create tone. Right. Um, and as a writer, 
you don't really have much opportunity to create tone because you're not the director, you're not the final author of the movie. And so what you're really doing is you're trying to suggest to the director what the language, what the grammar of the film is going to be. And so I find exposition is as good, if not better, a place to do it. And, and sometimes I'll write things. You know, Doug Lyman on Mr. and Mrs. Smith, um, we still talk about this. He, there's a line that he loves in the exposition that he hated once we actually started shooting because there was no way to actually mm -hmm. dramatize it, which is there's a moment in the movie where um, Angie is uh, sort of uh, going through ransacking the house, taking all of Brad, John's um, sort of possessions out of the house. And there are three little girls from the neighborhood that, w that um, walk by and stop and see Angie and all of her uh, sort of minions walking out of the house with like black bags full of things. And they say, what's going on, Mrs. Smith? And she says, garden party girls. <laughs> and in the exposition of the script, I said, they hopscotch away future killers, these three little girls. And that is just tonal. There's no way to express that dramatically right, unless but you it gets put the, a gun. But it gets the reader into a certain tone that you wanted. It does, mm -hmm. and it lets them know, I, I think one of the most important things, especially when you're working in, in genre films that aren't real. I mean, they're not, it's not ordinary people, you know? It's not, um, uh, it's, it's not dramatically real, is sort of informing the reader, and, and specifically, I think, the director and the actors as to what level of hyper-reality you're right. working in. You know, like how many degrees removed from our real world are we? Uh, when working in a hyper-real world, do you mm -hmm. have to be even more of a slave to a reality base for the characters? Because you have, to sus you have to get the audience to suspend their disbelief. Is it harder in a genre film than a non-genre film? I, I think that's the hardest part of writing genre films, actually, is to make the characterizations real because the situations are so unreal. Right. And I think it's the most important thing by far and away. What happens for me is that when I'm writing genre movies, or specifically action movies, or superhero movies, um, which are you know slightly different genre, um, whatever the action, whatever the superpower is, it has to be a metaphor for something emotional. Um, it has to be in the X-Men movies that Rogue's inability to touch people is just a manifestation of her inability to connect emotionally. Right. You know, it has to be in Mr. and Mrs. Smith that every one of those action scenes is an expression of something that's happening in their marriage. Mm -hmm. And you know, when we were working on that movie and when I was working on X-Men, I was lucky to be on the sets of both those films pretty much from start to finish and, and work closely with the actors. And the actors are never gonna ask you questions like, when am I firing the gun in this sequence? Right. They're asking, what is this emotionally about? Mm -hmm. um, and you have to be able to answer that question. One, just to be able to stick around. Right. And two, to, to I think, um, make sure that the action sequence or the superpower beat, which are expensive things in movies, survive. Right. Um, and the only way they're gonna survive is if they're servicing character or story, not if they're servicing effects. Were the scenes in the therapist's office always in the script? Yeah, the, um, it's funny. The idea for Mr. and Mrs. Smith came from a conversation I had with two friends that were in marriage therapy. I mean, that was the, the, the first spark for me that they started talking about therapy and they were talking about these five steps that they were going through um, or was that it, they were meant to go through. Was it Nick and Jessica? No, it was not okay. Nick and Jessica. Right, I just wanted, we can move on. Nor Brad and Jen. Um, right. But, uh, you know, it, the way they were describing marriage therapy, they were like, it was about, I still remember the steps, it was initiate, interact, communicate, compromise, and adapt, which I thought was a brilliant arc for, for a relationship. That's pretty ingenious. Yeah. It's great. I mean, the architecture, that's fantastic. And, and I also thought there was something with the way they talked about it that sounded sort of mercenary. It sounded so aggressive um, and active that I went home and I was like, I want to write a movie about marriage therapy. And because I write action movies and these are the movies I love, immediately I sort of came up with it's two people in marriage therapy who are also assassins and, and trying to kill each other, sort of go through their own process. So from the beginning, marriage therapy was the metaphor of the movie. And then the first time I went in and pitched anybody at, which was Akiva Goldsman, I pitched him, this movie is about marriage therapy. Why didn't you pitch me? I think you weren't a producer at the time, actually. Oh, you were running a right. studio. This was five years ago. <laughs> all right, go ahead. Continue. And I think, in truth, we did pitch it. To, uh, you were at New Line at the time, and okay. we did pitch it to New Line, and it wasn't you, but whoever was See, there passed, passed on it. See, so, you know, I did what I could. on his house. Did what I house. could. All right. Um, uh, so, yeah, no, those marriage therapy scenes were always the, the bookends of the movie. Right. They were always the beginning and the end. And then, um, as the script evolved, as it went through many, many drafts over you know, a series of years, um, they became more present in the first act of the movie. Now you went to Columbia Film School. Uh, was that essential to your success in retrospect, or do you think your success would have happened without it? I don't know. Um, I do think Columbia was essential to me in a lot of different ways. I think it, first it was a great place for me to hide out and do bad work and nobody ever see it. Right. You know, it's like when you fail, you want to fail quietly. Right. Um, and uh, I look back on the short films that I wrote and directed when I was at Columbia, and they're terrible. I mean, they're just like, you know, they're, they're pretty awful. And were the instructors constructive? The instructors were, were constructive, and more than that, the students were constructive. I mean, I think another thing that I learned at Columbia, other than how to write better and structure and rules and all those things you learn in whatever school you're in, was how to collaborate. Because you're sitting around a table with, you know, 10, 15 of your peers, and they're giving you notes, they're ripping apart whatever you wrote. You all watched or read each other's stuff? 
Yeah, we would read our, our, our work aloud in class or we would obviously watch the short films in class. And it was not that different than the development process I go through right. now. It's just that like those people aren't paying you and they're not in suits, right. um, but they're equally rapacious um, right. and, and, and maybe even a little bit more cruel because they're competitive with you, right. as opposed to thinking about how they're gonna place you. Right. Um, <laughs> so it was great for me in terms of you know, learning craft, learning how to collaborate. And in my particular case, I got really lucky and um, it became a conduit to the industry for me. Did you sell pitches while you were there? I did. To your professors, even? I did. I, I sold... Is um, that allowed? <laughs> it, it was tricky, actually. Uh, it, it, I don't know that it was... Um, I don't know if there was anything in the guidebook that told them that they weren't allowed to do it. I mean, it's not exactly like, you know, it's not sexual harassment. Or right. I didn't cross too many lines, but I, um, in my first year there, I wrote a script and, uh, and pitched the script, actually, rather than... It wasn't in a screenwriting class. It was in a producing... Um, intro producing class, okay. and the professor um, was Ira Deutschman, who you must know oh, a well. former head of Fine Line. Yeah, the first head of Fine Line. The first, I think, was the founder of Fine Line, and um, and Ira was um, was my professor, and he liked what I had pitched in the class enough to be intrigued to want to read the script, and he read the script, and then he optioned the script. But he was also very careful about how we sort of uh, you know pursued that, and right. very um, uh, involved the school and let them know what was going on. And then in my second year there. Um, I had this great experience where I was doing another producing seminar with Michael Hausman, who you must know. Is a, a producer of? Producer of People yeah. vs. Larry Flint mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Gangs of New York and yes. a bunch of great movies. And we had this amazing um, assignment in class, which is everybody in the class had to take home the same New York Post at, over the weekend. And we had to come up with a story, a, a film idea, based on one of the stories in the Post. Then we all came into class that, that Monday and pitched our story. I think the, that's how they do it at the New York Post. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for their sense. stories. But, that does make mm -hmm. sense. Um, and uh, we all pitched the, our ideas based on the Post articles on Monday, and, um, and then Michael chose the four or five they liked the most, and then he, we would come back and pitch to him and a guest, sort of pitchy, mm -hmm. um, that turned out to be Ed Pressman, okay. who was one of my idols growing yeah. up. I mean, he discovered the Coen brothers yeah. and De Palma Incredible and Oliver filmography. Stone. Yeah. yeah. Um, and goes way back, and uh, I mean, I was petrified. I, nobody likes pitching. I don't, I've never met a writer that likes pitching, and especially, you know, I was like second year in film school, and I, don't know, I was like 25 years old at that, and, um, Were there rules uh, to it that they told you, hey, it needs to be a certain length? Yeah, or? they said it was sort of needed to be 10 to 15 minutes long, right. which I find is pretty much sort of industry standard for pitch length. Yeah, there are major minutes. offenders of that rule. No, I know, I know, I know. And it, and it, right. and it, and it only hurts a pitch, I think, right. when you um, break that rule. But, I mean, I just wanted to get in there as quickly as possible, so I think I was like seven minutes long right. with Ed. Uh, and, um, and I had, you know, good luck or good fortune again that Ed actually called me the next day and said, I want to actually option that story. Oh, wonderful. Um, and then we pursued that together and didn't really go anywhere. But, you know, that was my first forays into Hollywood right. were that. And Ira, going back to the Ira story, is Ira sent that script out here to Hollywood. What was that script? It was called Ghouls in New York. It was a movie about 19th century Manhattan. It was about uh, grave robbers oh, cool. in New York and happened to be the same time period and very similar title to Gangs in New York, right. which didn't really help. Um, it's, it's life. And what, and what was the grave digging movie, The Devils? And the, that was a, That's Ghouls in New York. Uh, no, the one they made oh. with Jonathan Price. Remember that there was one grave digging movie? No, I don't know that movie oh, actually. It came and went. Yeah, well, it's the grave digging movie's not a hugely successful <laughs> a genre. Huge, no, big unfortunately. Giant market, no, yeah. no. We're waiting for the uh, breakdancing one. Yeah, no, believe me, as am I. Um, but uh, it didn't sell, but it did get me out here and got me meeting producers and executives and the representation. Mm -hmm. Should students consider that a real possibility or is it a rare occurrence? I mean, I do think it's a rare occurrence, but it's obviously a possibility. Um, I, I don't think that people should go to film school in order to um, meet professors that are gonna get them you know, working in the industry or sell to professors, but I do think that one of the things that's really valuable about film school are the people that you meet that can become, if not while you're there, eventually conduits right. to the industry. And that can be professors and it can be fellow students. I mean, I have friends now um, who, you know, I'm, I'm trying to help break into the industry. Um, and if they weren't in film right. school, then that wouldn't have been a relationship that they had. Is there one key figure that you would say was a mentor of yours? Yeah, um, I had a professor there uh, named Jamal Joseph, who's a screenwriter, um, was just a fascinating guy, was a Black Panther, spent like 10 years in Leavenworth Prison. It's just a really rich life, yeah. in addition to being a talented screenwriter. And he really um, took an interest in me and was incredibly supportive. I mean, the Columbia program is- I feel a like I had read something of his or had a project- He had something at, with at Don New Cheadle. Line. Yes, yes. he's very close okay. with Don. Uh, Knife Hand, yes. I think that Scott Frank was producing. Yes. Um, yeah, no, he is a, he's, he's an interesting, interesting screenwriter. And uh, Columbia is a school that is primarily geared toward independent filmmakers, it's like Lisa Jelodenko, Jim Mangold, at least when he was starting out. Um, Kim Pierce, uh, there aren't a whole lot of people. It's not like USC where it's like, right. you know, George Lucas and all these big guys. And 
my work is not independent oriented, right. you know, character driven little films about my bar mitzvah. It's like, <laughs> you right. know, there are huge things where things explode and um, people are firing at each other. How did you choose, did, did that go into, like how did you choose Columbia over USC or, or I didn't even apply to you. I mean, I grew up out here for the most part in LA and so I knew I didn't want to come back here for film school. I right. loved New York and I wanted to go to okay. school in New York. But I didn't actually apply, I, mean, I didn't know until very late that I was really gonna pursue this film thing. And it was a graduate program? It was a graduate program at Columbia. Um, I went to undergraduate at Brown and, and I, uh, after uh, being an undergrad, I sort of was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life and I actually thought I was gonna be an um, English professor um, or a, a cultural studies professor and um, the three graduate schools I applied to were two in cultural studies PhDs and one film school at Columbia. Um, I was like, I'm never gonna go to film school, but right. just in case, I'll apply to the But one did you have school. the movie bug kind of always. beating inside your heart anyway? Always, always. Mm -hmm. But I, the idea of actually working in the film industry was always incredibly daunting to me. Um, it just seemed like playing the lottery for the rest of your life. Right. You know? Um, and I grew up out here with a lot of friends whose parents were in the film industry, and in the 80s, it wasn't a particularly savory industry. I don't know right. that it is now, but right, especially right. then, it was like, it wasn't a world I wanted to be a part of. Um, you know, being a film professor, being a professor rather at, you know, some Ivy League school in some little town seemed like the ideal life. Right. And certainly a million miles away from Hollywood. But uh, I just, you know, I came close to going to one of those programs and at the end of the day, I just felt like if I don't take this chance now, I'll question it for the rest of my life. And so I ended up at Columbia. And, and in truth, Columbia was the one I applied to um, because it's the program that at least at the time was the most focused on screenwriting. What's the fellowship you won? Oh, I, I won a fellowship. Um, for that script, uh, Ghouls in New York, actually. What's, what's, what's the fellowship? It's called, called the Zachy Gordon Fellowship, and it's actually a really nice thing that was created by Dan Gordon, who's a screenwriter, mm -hmm. wrote Murder in the First, and a bunch of other scripts. Um, sadly, his son passed away very young, and uh, I think his son was a Columbia graduate. Okay. So he created this fellowship um, once a year. Uh, he, along with the screenwriting professors at Columbia, choose the screenplay of the students that they think is the best, I guess. Right. Um, and I was lucky enough to win that. When did you decide you were gonna pursue screenwriting as a career? Was it during the film school experience? Uh, no, I mean, once I went to film school, I really felt like, now that I'm here and it's a trade school and my parents are paying money to put me through school, I better actually pursue this. Right. But it was really, the summer before I went to film school, I mean, literally months before the semester started, I was this close to going to um, uh, Yale for uh, American Studies or Cultural Studies um, PhD program. And frankly, the thing that probably saved me more than anything else, even more than my passion for movies, was how crappy New Haven is as a city. I mean, no disrespect to whoever lives there, but like it's not where I wanted to spend the next right. six years of my life. And I was living in Manhattan and I was loving New York. Um, and so I went to New Haven to look for an apartment. I was like, what am I doing? I, I'm not passionate enough about this program. Um, I do have this passion gnawing at me for movies and I wanna live in New York and have a really good apartment in New York. I don't know why I'm giving it up. So um, I called Columbia and I was like, you know what? I made a mistake. I really do wanna to go to the program. Luckily somebody had fallen out and so I, fell in, um, and the second I had made that call, it felt a little bit like, okay, I've ripped the Band-Aid off, I can stop pretending I don't wanna do this, um, and I'm gonna really pursue it. Now there was a moment, was there a moment where you knew you were gonna be successful at it, where there was, you know, hey, this is gonna work for me? I think the truth about most screenwriters is, or most writers in general, are pretty neurotic, insecure people, or maybe just Jews too, but at any <laughs> rate, you know, with good like historical sure. precedent um, <laughs> for writers and Jews, but uh, you so know. So you still haven't had that I moment. still haven't had that like eureka moment where I was like, oh, I'm gonna do this for the rest of my life, and I definitely have it, you know, cornered. But um, I, you know, I think the first time you ever get paid to write something, it's a really nice feeling, and you do feel like I'm never gonna be um, the guy who's 55, 60, 70 years old saying, I'm still waiting for that first paycheck to come in. And that feeling was was pretty amazing. I mean, I. When, when you asked me about pit selling things, as selling pitches when I was in school, the first pitch that I really sold, not that got option, but they really sold was in that second year, because people out here had read that first script, Cools in New York, and liked it enough to meet with me. Um, I had a meeting with um, uh, a company called Mostow Lieberman, Jonathan Mostow and Hal Lieberman, and I had an idea for a movie and I pitched them the idea, and, uh, and we then developed the idea while I was in film school, so I was sort of jumping back and forth between New York and LA, <clears throat> and then we came out here, or I came out here rather, and pitched it, and Warner Brothers bought it. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a sort of a teenage horror movie. Uh, and did, that was- Did they make it? They did not make it. Um, it survived, I think, a couple drafts and went pretty quickly into turnaround, but it was the first paycheck. And I remember getting that call from my manager. Um, it was actually the week before Thanksgiving, and he said, uh, you're a professional writer. And that was a great feeling. I mean, that was a feeling of having arrived. I think that feeling was even stronger for me than you know, the first day being on the set of Mr. and Mrs. Smith, or the, that first weekend that Mr. and right. Mrs. Smith came out knowing that it was gonna be a big movie. Mm -hmm. um, but 
you know, getting paid to write does make you just a tiny little bit less insecure. Right. But you still have that gnawing you. I mean, I, was, I saw Kiva two, three days ago, and we were talking about pitching and specking, and he was saying he'll never write a spec. I know Kiva Goldsman is the, is the screen, screenwriter for Beautiful Mind and Da Vinci Beautiful Code. Mind, da Vinci Code, Cinderella mm-hmm. Man, right. um, uh, Lost in Space. <laughs> she worked with it. You know, it was I knew you were going to go with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he'll, he'll appreciate that I went right, there, too. Right, right. Um, but he was saying he doesn't want to spec something because he doesn't like, you know, sitting and waiting and being judged. Sure. And I was like, dude, you know, you're the most successful screenwriter in the world. I think that's sort of, you know, maybe that's arguable, but I would say the most successful now. And, uh, and yet he still has the same insecurity that we all have. Did you intern at a production company? Between um, undergrad and grad school, I interned at a production company in New York that actually was Ira Deutschman's company, Redeemable oh, okay. Features. Um, and, and Ira was a big part of why I ended up going to Columbia because he taught there and he'd always been really right. um, complimentary about the program and, and I had a lot of respect for him. What'd you learn from that uh, internship aside from getting to the Columbia program? An immense amount. I mean, I, th- I think one thing I would tell um, new screenwriters, young screenwriters is as important as reading screenplays or going to film school is actually working inside the system so that I think two things you understand. One is there is a real, and, and you know this as well as anyone, there's a language to development. Right. Um, it's a different language than reading movie reviews. Um, it's a different language than you have when you're just having a conversation with a friend about a movie that you liked or didn't like. Right. There is a real grammar to development, and it's good to learn that grammar, um, partly because there's euphemisms that mean something else. Right, give us an, uh, an example. Um, well, I mean, one thing is, uh, I, I think that, well, I'm trying to think of a euphemism. Um, in screenwriting, it's a great first draft, means you tanked, right? You know, um, or that the idea is still good enough that they're going to give you a second draft, but it's not a movie yet. Right. What do they say now when they love the first draft? I don't know what they say, but you tell me. <laughs> I don't know. It's like you know, we're not going to fire you, or I mean, I think the truth is when they right. love the first draft, what they say is we're going to a director and actors. Flowers come to your house as a muffin basket. Right. There's exactly. a whole day you declared in your honor. It's a whole all big, the perks. It's a thing. whole different thing. Yeah, it's like the Ed McMahon giveaway. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I think that you know, you do learn certain things like. If you get a call inside of the first day or two, they like the screenplay. Right. If, you, if you get a call after a week or two, it took them a long time to figure out how to nicely say we didn't like it. So a lot of nuances that you have to learn to interpret. There are, and I do think there's another thing that you learn, which is um, there are certain structural cues that I think you can only really learn in development. Like if the third act isn't working, it's, it's actually not necessarily because the third act isn't working, but because there are certain things you didn't seed in the first and second right. act of the movie. Um, and I, I think if you haven't been in the development, if you haven't watched the development of a script, successive drafts and how it progresses, how it sometimes gets better and how it sometimes gets worse. If you haven't seen some of those cautionary tales, you can fall into those traps pretty easily. Um, and that was really useful. And having access to new scripts is useful. Right. You know, and because, and you, again, you know this, the vast majority of scripts that are written and even the vast majority of scripts that are written like at the studio level are bad scripts. Yeah. Um, and it's just as useful to read cautionary tales as it is, as it is to read classics. Right. Um, and so, you don't really have access to those scripts unless you're inside the system a little right. bit. And so I was reading a lot of those and I was writing coverage on those. Right. Did, you, did you read the cautionary tales? Oh yeah, from I mean, the, past? The, the, the vast majority of the right. scripts that I was reading, doing coverage on were bad screenplays. Um, right. What was the worst? Oh God, I don't remember. <laughs> okay. I mean, there were, there were so many bad right, romantic right. comedies, right. Um, which is a genre that I just loathe to begin with. Right. But you get sent a lot of them because I think a lot of new screenwriters write romantic comedies because there well, is- Well, the studios say it's their favorite commercial genre, they just you know, can't figure out how to reinvent it. Right, and I do think it's, I think what happened last summer, actually, about romantic comedies is that there was a reinvention of them. I think that 40-Year-Old Virgin and Wedding Crashers and to some extent Mr. and Mrs. Smith were reinventions yes. of the romantic comedy genre. Um, and I think what was interesting about them is they were romantic comedies that were made for men. Right. Um, and so you had movies. I was just talking to um, Steve Faber, one of the writers of Wedding Crashers yesterday, and we were saying how we made these romantic comedies for men right. that had 60% female audiences. Right. So for whatever reason, women were still tricked into going to them. So genre blending can be a good thing sometimes. I think genre blending is the most, I mean, for me personally, right. that's the thing that keeps me awake when I'm writing. Right. And I think that makes me most excited when I'm watching movies. What did you do between Brown and uh, Columbia? Well, I, between Brown and Columbia, there wasn't a whole lot of time. It was two years of my life. One is I just dropped out and traveled around right. and, and, and played. And then um, I moved to New York and started working at that production company. I, before that, I worked a little bit at a publishing house. Um, because there was a moment when I was sort of, maybe I'm gonna be a real writer and be right. a novelist, and very quickly I realized I didn't have it in me to be a real writer. Um, so you're, it was really just. You're a real writer. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it, it, yeah. writing. Why do people make that distinction? Like, why do you think, because it's a new art form? I think it's because it's a new art form, and I think because, I think the biggest reason actually is less because it's a new art form and more because um, people don't know screenwriters' names. So you do, you know, people sure. watching this do, but. Um, a normal person in Little America, if you say who's Ernest Hemingway, they're like, well, vaguely a writer. Right. If you say who's um, Shane Black or Scott Frank or Kiva right. Goldsman, they're like, uh, I don't know who that right. is. 
So I think part of it is just there's a different um, level of authorship that's right. ascribed to screenwriting and, and novel, novel writing, obviously, and just that level of celebrity, which I think is real. Do you do much, re uh, much research when you're writing? Yeah, I do an obsessive amount of research. Now, uh, Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Smith has a ton of weapon yeah. in it. Did, did you do a lot of research for, for those kind of things? I did. Um, I joke, actually, with my wife that... Uh, that I'm sure I'm on like a thousand CIA watch lists and NSA watch lists. <laughs> right, for keywords into the Yeah, for between right. like, you know, by the way, even working on Triple X2 of like, you know, how would you get into the Capitol? Um, right. You know, <laughs> what are different places you can blow up in right. Washington, D.C.? Um, I'm sure that. Right. You're it, on some NSA wiretaps. Absolutely, unquestionably. Um, and so, yes, I did a whole lot of research on weaponry because it, I, I just sort of do research for two reasons. One is it's, it's nice to be able to do things that are authentic in the script and make people feel like they're, they're part of a real world. But less than the actual like product of that, like being able to say like an AK, whatever it is, yeah. or how many rounds per second, and know those things. Um, it's it's just to immerse you into the world. Sometimes, right. I mean, you want to become fluent in the world that your characters live in, so that you can understand those characters better. Sure. Not necessarily so that you can actually sort of name drop types of right. guns, um, but so that you really you are inside the vocabulary of those characters. Um, there's a fluency to it in a way. Actually, the more you know, the less you have to flex. Um, but again, it's something that when you're on the set of a movie. It serves you because when you can be standing with Brad Pitt and you know what kind of gun he has in his hand, you automatically have a coolness factor <laughs> right. that you wouldn't otherwise. And you can answer questions if, if questions come up. Absolutely. And look, and by the way, on these big movies, there's, there's also a, a gun specialist sure. who's there that knows more than I will ever know in my life, sure. thank God. But, but um, it's nice to be able to feel like you have a certain level of, you know, just sort of badass, right. whatever it is. You mentioned Jamal Joseph as your, as your mentor, um, a, a practicing screenwriter and, and a, a teacher for a deep... Do you, are you mentoring anyone? I'm trying. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, you know, the truth is, I feel like uh, most of the good things that have happened in my, in my career have been because of mentors. Jamal in school and, and really Akiva Goldsman um, out here. Do you stay in touch with Jamal? Yeah, very much so. I mean, I see him all the time. I, mean, I didn't see him all the time because he lives in New York, but we, we email back right. and forth. Does he time. still write? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. No, he's, 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 he's still working screenwriting. Right. Just, um, and he's heading the screenwriting department at Columbia now, which is great for him. Um, so I am, you know, there's a few projects that I'm working on that I'm the producer of, um, that I'm not writing, that were ideas that I had that I then brought to new screenwriters um, and sort of worked with them through right. the process a little bit the way that Akiva worked with me, um, developing it with them, really getting into the trenches with them, working on outlines, breaking character, breaking story, um, which I find great fun. I mean, part of the thing that's so fun about it is I don't have to do any of the heavy lifting. Right. You know, it's like... I mean, no offense to producers, right. but like you can come up with all the ideas and then you don't actually have to execute right. them. You're mentoring slash ordering. Yeah, exactly, around. exactly. No, it's like you go to a restaurant, you don't have to cook the food. Right. Um, and so uh, you get to go down the menu and be like, this looks good and that looks good, right. now go cook it. Um, and I've enjoyed it immensely. So I'm trying to do that and I'd love to do more of that. Um, partly because also, you know, I like coming up with original ideas. Uh, Mr. and Ms. Smith was an original idea. I hadn't done an original in, in a couple of years, um, and I had these ideas, I was busy doing other things, right. and I felt like I'd love to see these things develop as scripts, ideally become movies, and if I can't write them, why shouldn't somebody else?